Um, first of all, uh, the Rohatan Center for International Affairs for generous funding and administrative support. Also, thank you to the History Department, the Japanese Department, Women and Gender Studies, and Wanaka Commons. Finally, special thanks to the Japan Club, Japanese Club, and Masahiro Takahashi. Uh, Takahashi Sensei is the faculty coordinator of the club, and he really came up with the idea, and that club helped bring Mrs. Gordon to Middlebury. Nancy <coughs> Gordon was just five years old when her family moved to Tokyo from Vienna. Her father, Leo Sirota, a world-renowned pianist, had agreed to perform and teach in Japan, and was employed by the Imperial Academy of Music. Beati spoke Russian and German as a child and picked up Japanese very quickly. What did you say? Three, five weeks? Three and a half months. Three and a half months. Three and a half months. Um, in addition, she was teaching <coughs> French and English at an early age. She left Japan in 1939 to attend Mills College in California, where she majored in foreign languages. Before she completed college at the age of 19, she began working for the U.S. government, where she was invaluable because of her language abilities. When Beati Sirota Gordon returned to Japan just months after the end of the Second World War, she was fluent in six languages and only 22 years old. <laughs> Aren't we jealous? <laughs> we weren't there. Um, Mrs. Gordon is celebrated today for many accomplishments, including her long career at the Asia Society in New York as Director of Performing Arts, a role that allowed her to introduce the very best performing artists of Asia to American audiences. But, she, but what she'll be telling us about today is the indelible mark she left on, the, on Japanese society as a result of her participation in the drafting of the post-war constitution. Although Japanese feminists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries had rallied for the vote and for equal political rights in Japan, their voices were silenced along with those of other social critics in the 1930s and 40s. In 1946, as a member of the Allied Occupations Government Section charged with drafting a new democratic constitution for Japan, Gordon used her extraordinary linguistic and intellectual resources to convince the much older male committee members that equal rights for women were an essential building block to a new democratic society. After much deliberation, and unfortunately a bit of editing of some of her most progressive recommendations for social equity, two articles remain that grant equal rights to not only women, but to people of all races and social classes as well. For her brave efforts in drafting and fighting for these articles to the Constitution of 1947, Beati Gordon is highly celebrated in Japan today. For students at Middlebury College, working toward foreign language proficiency and international competence as global citizens, Mrs. Gordon's life and work should serve as an ideal model and inspiration. It's a great honor to have Mrs. Gordon here today. Please welcome. Thank Mrs. you. You will excuse me for not having stood up, but these chairs are not exactly for getting up and down all the time. So you will forgive me if I be. I will be sitting here. But in any case, I want to first of all tell you, don't be jealous of me that I learned Japanese in three and a half months. I was five and a half years old. What kind of conversation could I have had with the other children, right? That vocabulary was easy to learn because I know very well how difficult it is when you are learning Japanese and that it takes a long time, but it certainly is a wonderful thing that you're doing. I want to tell you right from the beginning, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here because this college I have known for years simply because I myself, being a language major at Mills College in California, which, is, which I don't know whether you know is a woman's college in Oakland, California, I knew about the successes you had had. I also would like to tell you that I'm very glad to see that there are very few professors here, only students, I mean mostly students, and it makes me feel comfortable because when I spoke, the first time I spoke in an American college was at uh, what is it, Columbia, and I saw all these professors and I thought, oh my God, you know, I don't even have a PhD, only an honorary PhD, and I don't consider that a real PhD. So I said, uh, I, you know, I don't, and I, you must know so much more about all of this uh, than I do. And one of the professors, uh, Arthur Tiedemann, very famous Jap Japanologist who unfortunately died recently, got up from the audience and he said, Beate, you don't have to be a PhD. 
you are an artifact. <laughs> now, I just want to say to you, he didn't say fossil. He said artifact. So it is as an artifact that I have come to speak to you about being there. I was actually a member, and I'm afraid I have to say I am probably the last member of the drafting committee. There is a Mr. Esmond who was in my section, but he, from the beginning when he was asked to be on the committee, said something that disturbed the other people. He was, I think, uh, against having the emperor system continue in Japan. And so he was conveniently sent for R&R &R <laughs> to a very beautiful place in Japan, which you probably all know, Karuizawa. Did you know that, Professor? Yeah. Well, now you know a secret. <laughs> well, in any case, so um, let me tell you just a tiny little bit about myself because I understand I have about 40 minutes and I want you to know about the actual writing of a constitution because, you know, that's so rare in one's life that one can do things like that. And I am, in a way, very sad that um, luck is so much a part of life. I really resent that. I would like achievement to be what leads you to these things. And people are always asking me, how did you get selected to you know, work on such an important thing as a constitution? Who was it who discovered you? And you know, it wasn't like that. And when you hear it, you will laugh because it is ridiculous. So I wish you lots of luck in your life because it happened to me and it brought me f to a point where I could, you know, participate in the constitution. So I was in Japan. I uh, was there for 10 years from five and a half on. I uh, st studied at the German school when the German school be became Nazified and we all had to say Heil Hitler before and after every class. I left the school, but at that time you couldn't leave schools easily. It was difficult to transfer, and you had to get a certificate. It was very complicated. So for six months, uh, if you would like to, to question me about anything to do with Nazism, all the songs I know, I will sing them for you. <laughs> I know everything about the Bund Deutscher Mädchen. I know about the Hitler Jugend. You name it, I know it, because I was in the German school. On the other hand, I also got a, got a very good education. At that time, German education was very, very advanced. And so, I mean, I really can't believe this, that at that time, which is pre-war, they even taught us stenography in, in high school. I bet now, there's nobody, of course, it's computers. I mean, you don't even know what stenography is, do you? <laughs> yeah, some, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, because I'm ancient and you're young, <laughs> then, you know, ask me. But anyway, so I uh, uh, had a very good education. And when I got to the American school, which I transferred to, which was also in Tokyo, in Japan, um, I was so advanced, I mean, that they didn't know what to do with me. I was 13. And I wanted to take French, and I wanted to take Russian, and I wanted to take all these things, and Latin, which I had already taken at, the, at uh, the other school, at the German school, and various things. And I would have fitted, I think, into maybe uh, not quite the freshman year of high school, whatever they had before that. But I had had all those courses, and so they made me a sophomore in high school. At the beginning of the semester, yes, in September, when I entered, and I was not a native English speaker. I, English was an acquired language. I learned that in Japan in those, you know, in those years that I lived in Japan, and I learned mostly from the British ac embassy friends that I had. So I spoke with a British accent, which didn't endear me to the American school <laughs> particularly, and I also was shocked at the way they were, we were taught. It was the exact opposite of the uh, German school. In the German school, I once on my desk went like this while the professor was speaking over there. And I was later on afraid that I would be expelled for having done that. 
So I'm just giving you that as an example. I wasn't expelled, but I was almost expelled for something else, which also was in such a category that it was ridiculous. But that's why I, I can't, I don't know anything about geography. I've traveled all over the world. I cannot learn geography because geography, the teacher was a special Nazi who was sent from Germany to teach abroad. And uh, he uh, said we should make a profile on, uh, that, what is that called? That paper that has many, many lines with uh, gra gra graph uh, paper. Yeah, graph paper. We should make a line, a profile of the United States. I did, and I'm not very good at that kind of thing. And I made a mistake, and I had to erase it. And when I erased it, there was a little hole in the paper. And uh, I wanted to cover that. So I made it thick, you know, more. <laughs> made the whole line, a thick line about this. And I handed it in, and the professor turned around to the whole class and said, does anybody, do you all know a little German or something? No. I say it in English then. Look at what this stupid, stupid Beate did. I asked for a profile, which after was just an idea. It's not, it's nothing, you know, that you could put your hands on of the United States. And she made such a thick line. It should almost be ethereal. And he laughed, and they laughed, and I cried. And because of that, I am unable, I try, maybe I should take a class, but I am unable, if you'd ask me anything about, I've been everywhere in Asia except uh, Bangladesh. I have no idea which is where, I cannot learn it, I cannot learn it. But he was a very special teacher, and real. Uh, <laughs> so, in any case, in the American school, everything was very laissez-faire. People, you know, did anything they wanted. They went like this in their chairs, not allowed in the German school. Teachers put their arms around the students. We, uh, arm around the student. So, um, anyway, it was very different, and there were cliques that I didn't know about, and there were all these students who had been together for all these years, and here I was, a complete uh, stranger in all kinds of mores. I you knew my customs were different. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I, the German school had told me that lipstick and dancing, which was done at the American school, was like Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> and everybody had lipstick girls, you know, 13, I had lipstick on, now, you know, it's all very different. Anyway, so I, uh, I studied very hard because that I could do, and uh, I was in, in classes with uh, students of uh, other grades, higher grades. And so I learned a lot from other women who were older than, than I was and who knew whatever little more than I did. I'd never dated before that don't do that in the German school or anything like that. I, I didn't know how to dance. Uh, that I didn't know. I, my father taught me the tango. <laughs> that was the first one. But I didn't know. But otherwise, uh, you know, their life was very different. And I was very much involved in Japanese society in the sense that I played with Japanese children. And I'll just give you a little uh, reason that I think my mother was so intent on getting me not only to learn Japanese, but know about Japanese culture. Because when we arrived, as I say, at five and a half, at the dock in Yokohama, and got looked down you know, at the harbor, and I saw all these people, all with straight black hair, black eyes, I said to my mother, aren't they all brothers and sisters? And I think my mother was so shocked that I could think in that way that she insisted on getting me to know these people. But you must understand, I had never seen an Asian in Vienna. There weren't at that time. Maybe there were somewhere, but I'd never seen one. So there were all these black-eyed, uh, black-haired people. And immediately after arrival, I uh, got very friendly with, in the <coughs> hotel with the elevator man because he went up and down at the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, which was 
which was created by an American architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, and um, spent my time with him. He taught me a lot of Japanese <laughs> the week we were there. And then uh, we moved into uh, another house, and we ended up near a very famous shrine, the Nogi Shrine. And I'm just mentioning this because there's some of you here who are from Japan or have been there, and it's a very famous shrine. And we, our house was right near there. And I started immediately being introduced to the neighbors, who were mostly Japanese, uh, some others too, but these were Western-style houses. And so I uh, got to play with the Japanese children. I learned all the games. If any old Japanese games you want to learn, ask me. So I played with the girls, and I saw the daily life. You know, I mean, we used to play in the garden, and uh, in Japan, things, you know, I mean, now everything is much different in the United States than it used to be. But for example, it was not at all strange, if it was very hot in their garden, that we would take off our dresses and just, we had at that time on wore slips underneath the dresses. We would play, uh, you know, with the hagoita, which is uh, a... Um, Battle door and shuttlecock, it's called. It's a game. It's like badminton a little bit, and we would practice because we were going to play this on New Year's Day and so on. And I would go to see the kamishibai, that is paper theater, outdoor theater, where a man came and sh made a sketch of some famous tale in Japanese history and then would explain the story, and we stood there and listened and then paid him, I think, a penny, and he gave us the candy. And the candies were very good in Japan, very good. So I must say I enjoyed my childhood tremendously in Japan with these friends. The uh, they absorbed me uh, as into their own family. I ate with them, I played with them, everything, exchanged presents with them, learned what they were doing. They were playing the, the koto, in order to get married, they had to start very early to learn all the arts which were necessary for marriage. So they were studying all these, but I also heard them say all along, until I was 15 years old, how they would have to marry somebody that they didn't even know and maybe would not even meet till a week before because it would be an arranged marriage. And, you know, I had gone to Hollywood movies to see because Hollywood movies came to, um, to Japan, two years after they came out here. So I had seen all these wonderful Hollywood, all those wonderful romantic things with boys and girls together, getting married and all that. And here, there were going to be girls who would never even know the person that they were getting. And I thought that was terrible, and which it is, of course. But I, I wanted to just tell you these things because a lot of what I've learned has not been from books. A lot of it that I have learned is really by osmosis. I was very lucky in that. The other lucky thing is that my parents couldn't speak Japanese, so that I was their interpreter. And so I went with them to all kinds of things which I never would have known about, like the bureaucracy in Japan or something like that. I knew because I went with my parents when they needed a permit at the police or anything like that, and I saw how bureaucratic the Japanese officials were. And then I also learned about militarism. Uh, and, you know, it was a life under a totalitarian regime. And I learned about such things as, you know, soldiers coming to your front of the door to protect you when there was uh, the assassination time in Japan, every, in all of the big <laughs> leaders were being assassinated. We had police in front of us with bayonets ready to <laughs> stick in to anybody who's going to come. I knew that I must never talk about politics in public, never say anything against the emperor or the, uh, whatever it was. I knew that if I went to a parade and I, the emperor was coming on his horse, I would bow down, don't have to one was allowed to look at him. And I knew all this because I was copying my Japanese friends and I was being told by my parents. So uh, I knew more than most children knew 
uh, at that time because the American, French, German, other children went to the French club, the German club, and this club and that club and played with their own friends. So they neither knew Japanese nor what was going on in Japan, and I did. So uh, I will tell you only one more thing about uh, living in Japan in a militaristic country. The Kempei Tai, for you who know Japanese, it is a mili military police, sort of like, I don't know whether you could compare to the MPs or maybe a little bit CIA and FBI mixed up in it, came to my house every single day because we were foreigners and they had noticed that there are many cars with foreign licenses like the Russian embassy, <laughs> the French embassy, the German embassy. And that was because some of these people were my father's students, piano students. They came to our house. The others he had at the Imperial Academy. But they were, the police were suspicious. Why are all these foreign country nationals coming to our house? So they watched us. And one day I said to my mother, who gave a lot of parties, my father was a, a pianist, and, you know, there had to be a lot of... PR and all that, and I made the cards for the table with the names of each person. And one day I said to my mother, you know, why don't we keep the cards? Because you often invite the same people again, and then I will only have to write the new cards of the new people <laughs> and the old cards. I hated it. I couldn't do handwriting. You know why I did? I had such bad handwriting. I learned German Gothic script first, <laughs> and then when I went to the American school, I learned Latin scripts, and my handwriting, you'll see it later on, it's awful. So, um, I, my mother said, that's a good idea, Beate, but I don't know where, the, where those cards are. Um, you better ask the cook. Because my mother couldn't say anything complicated like that to the cook to ask her. My mother's Japanese was what we call kitchen Japanese. The, if she wanted the servant to take away the plate after dinner, plates after dinner in Japanese. Those who don't know, sara means plate. And sayano, sayonara, you all know, right? <laughs> Goodbye. So she would say to the maid, sara, sayonara. <laughs> and the maid understood, took it away, and never taught my mother to say things correctly. So it was a very interesting Japanese. So let's, let's go away from that. I, um, I went, uh, well, as I say, I graduated from the American uh, school when I was 15 and a half because I was so advanced through the German school that I could do that. And I went to Mills College. If you ask me why did I go to Mills College, it's a woman's college in California. My parents thought I would be safe there. <laughs> Also, it was the closest college to Japan. Much difference that that made, but that was before the war, you know. So I went, I came here, and 13 days by ship. At that time, the planes, the commercial airplanes were not around. So got to San Francisco, and then I went to Oakland, where it's near San Francisco, where the school was. It was a beautiful campus, very, very nice. and. Only women, and the woman who was the president was a feminist, early feminist. And so in that school, uh, we were very much, you know, urged to work towards careers. Because to you, that means nothing now, because you, all of you are going to go into careers. At that time, it was not so. Uh, some people did, but, I mean women, but most didn't. And only with the war, when the war started in the United States, then women went into factories and they would work where men had left and started really working. So there had been a, a lot of discrimination against, against women in the United States. And I hadn't known about that. It was very interesting. And I had, again, as I said, I was the youngest. There were older, uh, there were people who were even seniors and graduate students into his into which classes I was put because, again, I was so advanced in French literature or in German, you know, or any of those language classes that they had to put me in a very high class because I spoke better than the man who 
who taught Japanese, for example, in the first year, he, he had a terrible accent and all that. So they always had to put me into all these higher classes, and I always had the benefit of having the older students, you know, help me. So anyway, I uh, <coughs> got through in my junior year when the war began, which meant I would have no communication with Japan. The Japanese government didn't permit it, of course, and no money because they wouldn't be able to send any money. I had a little bit of money left from, my parents were only allowed to send $100 a month to Japan before the war. Now, nothing. But from that $100, I had saved quite a bit. I mean, you will be surprised. At that time, at Mills College, board was $500 and uh, tuition was $400. $900 a year. So, you know, it's not, it's not like now. So, and I, and I had a scholarship, that's right. I had a trustee scholarship. I did not have to pay tuition, so only room and board. So I had enough money to cover that, but I was afraid a little bit, you know. What was I, 17? You know, what, what can happen? One never knows. And be all alone in a country that you don't know. So I tried not to spend it too much. So I took a job in the summer, during the summer vacation. And, when, and the war just had begun. So they were desperate for people who knew Japanese. It was, not e it was so easy for me to get a job. The people came to the campuses of all the university colleges begging for people who either had lived in Japan, had studied Japanese language, anything, history, whatever. So everybody wanted me. And everybody at Mills was so surprised, you know, of that. But that was the reason. Do you know how many people there were before the war who knew Japanese? I mean, Caucasians, not the Japanese Americans. Would anybody like to guess? Guess how many Americans? Americans, Japanese Caucasians. Yeah. <laughs> 60. 60 in the whole. My husband says that's not true. I said, what? Yes, he said, I heard 66. <laughs> so anyway, they wanted me. I was not yet an American citizen. I was an Austrian citizen, which meant I was a friendly alien because Austria had been taken by Germany as part of the German Reich. So, but, you know, supposedly unwillingly, which is not true, Austria was very Nazified, but it was, had been a you know, separate country. But now, and I had to get a German passport. So I got a, uh, I mean, at that time, I, I got a German passport. So anyway, there I am, and the FBI, the CIA, Office of War Information, everybody came to the campus. And of course, FBI would not want a non-citizen in a, sensitive position, and some of the others. But there was a thing called the CBS, you know, of CBS radio, listening post. And that was civilian at the time, at the beginning. And they needed to, trans to translate Japanese broadcasts from Japan, which were directed towards <laughs> the United States. Because even in a plain news uh, commentary sometimes, or even in the news that they talked about on those broadcasts, because it was beamed to the United States, they thought intelligence could be learned. There were always things that get, could be learned, and you will see what kind of things. Now, this I'm telling you because... How long have I been speaking? Ten minutes? can't see. About 20. 35 minutes, well, I'll have to go over this quickly. Um, I um, went to, to audition for them, and uh, I thought, well, you know, I lived in Japan for 10 years, but I'm telling you this, the ones who are learning Japanese aren't having difficulties. Have, after, having been ten, after having been for 10 years in Japan speaking Japanese fluently, I couldn't understand a single word on the radio. Well, you know why, because they were using bungo tai, and more, for those who don't know about Japanese, there are several levels of Japanese, literary Japanese, uh, newspaper Japanese, this kind of Japanese. I had never heard in Japanese at the age of 15 about a uh, 
aircraft carrier. How would I? I mean, I wasn't interested in that. So I didn't know any of those words, and those were the words I had to listen to. So I decided to make a dictionary for myself because I couldn't get a dictionary in, in, in New York, uh, sorry, San Francisco. Couldn't get a dictionary, all bought up by the Army and the Navy. So I finally found a former pupil of my father's from Harbin who had a Chinese, Japanese, Russian, English dictionary. Or the other way around, whatever. So we had to look things up in Russian and in Chinese and in Japanese and in English. And, and that's how I made my lists every day, uh, listening. This was the audition period, two weeks or so, having these things on all day long. Shortwave broadcaster was extremely noisy, and, it, and I didn't understand a word. So when the editor came by and asked me how well I had done, I said, I didn't say I didn't understand a word. I just said, I find it quite difficult, I'm not used to this. He said, oh yes, the noise is terrible. And I wanted to say, it isn't the noise, it's that I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so I studied very hard in those first two weeks, wrote everything down. And after two weeks, I got a broadcast, which I summarized. We had to, by the way, try that sometime. Have an American newscaster talking and you translate it into another language on the typewriter. Item by item. Just try it. I became a very, very fast and inaccurate type, typist, but fast. And they, that's all they wanted, to know what is the item about. Well, there was one item on my sheet that day that this man looked at and he said, my God, are you sure this is right? It was about a Japanese submarine approaching San Francisco. And he said, are you sure, Beata? Because we recorded it also. On, I would go like this because it was a, a roller kind of thing that you recorded things on. It had wire or something. It was the earliest of these <laughs> computers. <laughs> but anyway, if one had an important article, one went back to this rolling thing and did it word by word, what the announcer had said. Now, I was absolutely sure that I was right because I had just learned the word for submarine the day before. Really, truly. So I knew it was correct because the other words I was able to understand. It was always these key words that I didn't know, but I had learned it the day before. Sui Sengtang. So when I did that, they hired me on the spot because nobody else had gotten it. All the already professional people had not gotten it. Nobody knows why. Maybe their earphones were not so good or whatever it was, but nobody had. So I was considered, you know, whatever. So I then was, you know, hired immediately. And then I said, well, now I have to leave soon. In a month or two, I have to go back to college. At that time, there was no such thing as taking a year off to find yourself. <laughs> so knowing that, knowing that, I decided I have to finish college first. So they sent a person to my college to speak to the president. This is CBS radio, uh, radio to plead with them to let me continue there at the office and also continue working towards my degree. And so advanced was this woman at that time, don't forget this is wartime, she said, yes, I will do that. We will, you don't have to come to any classes. <coughs> you, can, you, will to, you can only do term papers, which you can do in your, at home, and you have to take examinations, that's all. And I only had three credits left anyway. I was pretty advanced in the junior year already and had taken some senior courses. So I had only three. But, you know, only three when you're working full time, very, very difficult. <coughs> I worked a swing shift, which was from 7 to 11 at uh, CBS Radio Post. And then I came home around 11, 12 o'clock. And then in the morning, I woke up and I did my studies. 
and I did that for six months. Every day, including weekends, never, never, you're not even going out to dinner or to a nightclub or anything like that. And I was, I was very much a person who liked to go out. So it was very, very hard. And when I finished, a few years later, I looked at a calendar to look what I had done afterwards. And I found out that for the last two years, no, for the first two years after this, I went out every day. It looked like that on my calendar, really, because I absolutely went into that. Nothing serious. I mean, theater, opera, that kind of thing, of course. But, uh, you know, dinners and parties and all that. It was so hard because I had to do so well. And I also had to study so hard for the radio broadcasting, which I kept on learning new words and so on. But anyway, that is that. The war ended. I, and I had also worked for other war organizations in, in America. I had done the other way. I translated from in English into Japanese, and it was broadcast to Japan. A little bit, have you ever heard of Tokyo Rose? She was the propagandist from Japan, and I was being called the American Tokyo Rose. So I did these translations of propaganda. And then I um, switched. Uh, I wanted to to go to New York. I had never been in New York, and this was opportunity uh, to go to New York. I came to New York. It was almost the end of the war, and I worked for Time Magazine. And at Time Magazine, I was put into the foreign news section in charge of all the Japanese articles that came into the magazine. I'm was not allowed to be a writer because women were not allowed to be writers. We only could be researchers. And there was only one woman executive, and that was the head of the researchers at Time Magazine. We were responsible for any letter to the editor to Time Magazine from a customer who said, oh, you made a mistake. You know, it's only this, so many miles from here or that. And they were I don't know why, but at that time, they were so afraid of a mistake. It was trying to, Time Magazine was trying to show that it never made a mistake. They took it very, very seriously, and you could be fired for that as a researcher, not the writer. In the end, after all, it was the writer's business to write the article and be responsible. He got more money. You know, than we did. He supposedly was more experienced and so on, but we got the blame. So, and, we, and you know how they knew that we had read the manuscript? was that we had to make a dot on every single word. So, uh, this was before a letter arrived. I said to the writer and to its editor, you have made a mistake here. So there, there is no, to I think, two-bladed samurai sword. And they said, why do you say that? I said, because I did research on it. I write some <clears throat> Japanese material, and there are none. So the editor says, well, I fought already in one of the battles in Iwo Jima or wherever it was, and I know I saw a samurai sword. And I said, well, maybe you saw another sort, but it's not a summary side. They refused to give in because they were up, and I was down. And uh, I said, well, I read it in a Japanese book, and the editor said, I can't read Japanese. I said, I'm very sorry, but I can't put my dot on this. So they took it to another researcher who put her dot on it. Oh, I've got nothing to do with Japan, so. Well, nobody caught that. Then they caught me in a thing that was not to do with Japanese, but with figures. I'm very bad in mathematics. And I converted Japanese yen into dollars, and I made one zero mistake. You know, too many zeros. And somebody read it and wrote in a letter to the editor and said, can people in your office count? This is a zero more, which is a lot more than <clears throat> So the editor called me in, and he said, why did you do that? I said, I made a mistake. It 
wasn't enough. Would you please write a report on it? And I thought, well, how can I re write a report about a zero? You know? <laughs> so I hesitated, and I already knew that I was going to go to Japan. So I didn't do it. The first Time magazine correspondent who came to Tokyo looked me up in the government section and asked me for the report. Can you believe it? <laughs> for the zero. So anyway, I, I left uh, New York to go to Washington to get a <clears throat> I wanted to go back to Japan because my parents were there. I hadn't seen them for many years. And I wanted quickly to go to Japan. Didn't even want to work anything just to get there. So they said, Miss Sirota, you can't go. You are just a civilian. This is an occupied country. We don't let civilians go there now. This was 1945 in September or October that I asked for this. No, they said, can't do it that way. I said, is there any way I can do it? And I, they said, yes. Uh, if you become <clears throat> a civilian attached to the army, you can go. I said, sure, why not? So he said to me, well, what can you offer? And I said, I speak really and write Japanese, and I have lived in Japan. Oh, no more questions. <laughs> Immediately, maybe fill out form, first of all, to get a passport <clears throat> and go to the State Department, get the American passport and so on. So I filled out the application form, which under, you know, they ask name, da, 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 occupation, and I said, research expert. That was the title that I was going to have in, a, in Japan, research expert. So I put down research expert, came back to get it. They did it very quickly for me. And I look at the thing on, on the occupation, and they made a mistake. They left out research. So my occupation was expert. <laughs> <laughs> so as expert, I went to Japan. Nobody else was there. <laughs> When I arrived in Japan, it turned out I was the first civilian woman to come to Japan. And, I mean, I was still a civilian, but I was attached to the army. But from the army's point of view, I was still, you know, not, I was not a whack. I was not a woman's army corps, anything. I was, they had no billets for me, no place to put me. So I said, well, you know, I mean, I have my war department card and all that kind of thing. So they put me up with the, the wax. You, you know what the wax are, yes, everybody is. So they said, well, you'll have to stay for a few days with the wax in their billet because, so I said, fine, I don't care. And I went into the barracks where the wax were and it turned out to be lovely women who the first thing they asked me, is there anything you would like particularly? I said, what do you mean, like what? And they said, like perfume or a radio, even a Jeep or <laughs> something that you would want. I said, why, how, you, how can you give out things like that? And she said to be the one, well, you know, I work for one of the top generals, and he has a pilot who goes to Shanghai every week on Saturdays. For the weekend, he goes away. And we ask him to bring us these things. Shanghai is an open port. You can have anything you want. That was my first introduction to the wax. <laughs> so uh, I then went, uh, tell me how many minutes I have left. Oh, 10 ish. 10 ish, all right. Yes. Well, very short, went to Karuizawa, which is uh, the, uh, this resort, that I went to where my parents, I found my parents, my house in Tokyo had been destroyed by bombardment, and so had everything in the neighborhood been destroyed so that I couldn't recognize anything in Japan, in Tokyo, nothing. Everything was finished. So I um, went to Karuizawa, somebody had suggested it, and I, I found my parents and was with them for an could tell you many interesting stories about their life during the war. They were on the village arrest. They had to stay in their, in their village. They could not travel anywhere, and they couldn't buy anything from a Japanese private person, only in stores that were government uh, controlled, and it was very little, and it was very little food that they could get, and they had no fuel, and it was 
as cold as it is in the Berkshires, I mean, really. So they had a very bad time, and I have only to tell you two things because I think they are rather charming. The secret police came every day to interrogate them, and there were two questions. Why am I in America? And the second question is, do you have a uh, what it, um, radio which can pick up foreign broadcasts? And they said no. And that they came for three years to, uh, to ask every day. My mother had chickens before because of the eggs to have extra food. And she, the chicken flew into a tree. And she couldn't get it down. It was too high up. And when the secret police came that night, she said, instead of asking silly questions over and over, why don't you do something useful? Climb up the tree and get me my chicken. <laughs> I don't know. You don't understand what this means. I mean, I was horrified just hearing about it, that she could say such a thing to the Kempe Thai. Well, he did it. <laughs> and he brought, he brought the chicken down, and my mother had eggs. <laughs> OK, now we go to Japan. I arrived in Japan, as I told you, and I stayed with the wax. And in about a week, they had a billet for me at the former YMCA, which they turned into a women's, uh, a women's uh, billet. Yeah. So I moved in there, and I was told that I would work for the government section, which was the section closest to MacArthur's heart. And so uh, I got there. And for one month, they assigned me to what was called the political affairs section. Three people, two men and I, and jokers called it the affairs section, not the political affairs section, which was completely untrue because <laughs> one man was married and had his wife in Japan. She was a whack, and so she, could, she, she was able to come, you see, and so she was working there. And the other man was a professor from uh, some college, anyway, no, an older man. And I was in that section, and because they knew that I spoke Japanese, et cetera, et cetera, they assigned me to watch over the new political parties which were coming up in Japan because democracy, well, that to them meant political parties. So political parties were formed three people, five people, ten people. 25 people, so I was very busy running around, and they wanted me to report on women in politics. So I went to Kato Shizue, you know, all these people had things that were happening, the feminist movement, and it was a strong movement even before the war. So I went to these things and you know, made memos and so on, wrote reports, one month. And after one month, I arrived at my office, nine o'clock in the morning, I think, and there's an announcement. You will now go to General Whitney, our general, General Whitney's conference room. He has an announcement to make. Mm, 20 of us were called. I think there were 25 maybe in the whole section, but only 20 of us were called. We go in and we sit down. And he says, you are now a constituent assembly by order of General MacArthur. And you will write a new Japanese constitution in seven days. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you would have been surprised if you made that. <laughs> However, when you are in the army, you somehow get in with the crowd. Anything that's ordered by General MacArthur, you do. Don't even ask a question. I don't think cannot remember any questions, but he I really can't. And he told us a, a little bit of why, uh, because the Japanese government has, was supposed to write it, and we knew about that. And there had been a sample of a constitution in the newspaper, in the Mainichi Shimbun, about two or three days before that. This was MacArthur's reaction to that very bad uh, constitution which was exactly like the Meiji, the former constitution, very, very conservative, nothing different from the Meiji constitution. So MacArthur got tired of it, not only tired, he also, I think, was thinking of running for president of the United States. He wanted to have a beautiful record of the 
great, you know, beneficial occupation of Japan. And by the way, it was. I, I don't think there had ever been an occupation that was as good as that, even though it was under General MacArthur. But he had tremendously good advisors, all from the New Deal. And they were wonderful and very, and because I guess he was so different, they were able to influence him because they were so smart <laughs> and intelligent and educated and all that. So anyway, we went to our desks right after this announcement, because seven days is not very long, and uh, to do a, a new constitution. But, I mean, we had 20 people and we were divided up into sections. And Colonel Cadiz, whose name you have, of course, heard, who was the deputy director, and as far as I'm concerned, he ran the whole operation and he ran the whole occupation of Japan because he was so brilliant. And Colonel Cadiz comes up to our little section, the three of us, the two men and I, and he said, you, political affairs division, will now become the division that will write the civil rights of the Constitution, and left. The three of us look at each other, and Colonel Roost, who was the head, said to me, and to Wiles, you know, in seven days, we can't write this Constitution, even one section of it, as a committee. We have to divide it, even, a, you know, a, a section on civil rights can be two pages, three pages, you know. We have to think, we have to, I mean, no, none of us has ever written a constitution. <laughs> so I said, yes, of course, you're absolutely right. And then he said, he looks at me and he says, you're a woman. And I said, yes, I am a woman. <laughs> and he said, uh, why don't you write the women's rights? I'm telling you this because that is how it happened. Why don't you write the women's rights? And I said, Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> and then I said, but you know, I also write, I also want to write about academic freedom. I mean, obviously, I was just out of college three years, and it still was something that, you know, so he said, okay, anything you like, it's fine with me. <laughs> so I said, okay, then I'll write the women's rights and academic freedom. And having hated working in Time magazine, but having learned a lot because I was a researcher, I immediately thought, how am I going to do this? I know the American Constitution a little bit, but how am I going to write things in the correct form, you know, and this and that, and, and women's rights, I know it won't be that difficult, simply because women had no rights in Japan, no rights at all. So I thought, that, that's not the difficulty, but you know, what kind of rights? And so, on. so, researcher, what do you do? Library. So I took a jeep with a Japanese driver and I said, take me to three libraries in Tokyo, anywhere, I don't care where it is. And when I looked around, I saw nothing. And he said, Three libraries, that's going to be difficult to find. And I said, well, do your best. I said, why three libraries? And I didn't tell him, but the reason was this was top secret. We had been sworn to secrecy. We were not even allowed within our own section to speak to other people about what we were doing. It was going to be presented in the end as a Japanese written constitution, and they were going to go through the whole thing with the Japanese government and with the emperor announcing it. So couldn't, tell. and I was afraid if I go to one library and I say, could you lend me all the constitutions that you have for just about a week or so? <laughs> I was afraid, you never know. You know, she might ask a question if I asked for so many. So I only asked for two or three and went to three different libraries and assembled, I think, 10. And when I came back, to the office, everybody came around me. You have the co other constitutions from other countries. <gasps> Lend it to them, because everybody was in the same boat. No one, of course, had written a constitution, and there was no constitutional lawyer in our group. I mean, MacArthur had had some constitutional lawyers before come to, uh, you know, who had visited, with whom he, I'm sure he had talked. 
but not, not with the staff. The staff knew nothing. Not even Colonel Cady's knew anything till that weekend. It was all over the weekend that it was decided. And on Monday, they told us that we were going to write it. So I became very popular, and uh, <laughs> lend me your constitutions, and I uh, read them morning, noon, and night. And to my great surprise, found a great many very good rights in the other constitutions, very different from the United States Constitution. So I wrote and wrote in what fits Amer the Japanese culture, what would be good for Japanese women. I remembered all these things from my childhood, and I fitted what these things were into my reminiscences, which, would, which I should really put in. So I didn't only put human rights, which is sort of the American idea. It was the steering committee's idea. They were all Americans. I also put in social welfare rights. I wrote a lot of social welfare rights because in other constitutions there were. And I knew that with Japan it was very important to have women's social rights also. So I wrote 20 articles, two pages. I presented it to my boss, Colonel Roost, and Dr. Wiles, who the professor. Now, they loved my my. We love it. They're excellent. And why? Maybe they were progressive, and maybe it was because Colonel Roost was married to a whack. And that was very avant-garde at that time, to be married to a military person, you know, a woman. So he was more liberal, and Dr. Wiles just loved women. Loved them. Any woman. <laughs> and so any rights that I could give to the Japanese women were welcome to him. So I am very happy and proud and confident. And I'm 22 years old. And I walk into the steering committee, three men, all over 40, all are lawyers and experts in the American Constitution. Colonel Cady's looks at my thing and he says, my God, Beate, you have put more rights into this constitution than there is in the US constitution. And I said, Colonel Cady's, that's very easy to do. <laughs> the American constitution does not have the word women in it. Silence for a moment. <laughs> Colonel Cady's, whom I, by the way, adored because he was so marvelous. And he says, but they asked that you put all these social welfare things in. That doesn't belong in the Constitution. That belongs in the civil code. I said, Colonel Cady's, the Japanese bureaucrats who are going to write the civil code are never going to write anything more liberal than is in the Constitution. If it's in the Constitution, they'll have to do it. Otherwise, they won't. So he said, Beate, don't worry about it. We'll be here for a while. We'll oversee it. And we'll see to it. Because we don't really object so much to your, uh, to your rights. But it's the idea that it should be in a Constitution. This should be in a civil code. And I repeat it once more. The bureaucrats will never write it. And they did. They did. And when I come now and the Japanese women find out what I wrote, if they could have had that in the Constitution, they wouldn't have had to struggle. They have only been able to pass one of the things that were similar to what I had written. And that took 10 years in the courts. And it, I don't even know if it is already in the civil code, but it at least passed all the courts. And supposed to be in, and I had written about 20 such things, including children's, children's uh, equality in, in schools, you know, all that kind of thing. Well, in any case, I was so upset when he said that he wants to cut out all the civil rights, I mean, the civil rights that is the, the social thing, social welfare, that I began to cry. And I uh, was very embarrassed, you know, to cry in front of 
three, you know, top colonels of the occupation, and, and my own, you know, colleagues was very embarrassing, but I was so involved emotionally in this. You know, I wanted this so much that uh, Colonel Cadiz wrote in an article that he came over and that I cried on his shoulder. I don't remember that. <laughs> I only remember crying very bitterly, being very upset. And then I decided, what can I do? These people are more powerful than I am. You know, I'm 22, they are, I don't want, they have ranks, they have close relationships with the general. So I finally decided, well, I did get all the fundamental rights in, you know, equal, uh, that men and women can be, should be equal, that they can do the same thing, that marriage should be based on man and woman involved, not upon the parents or just the man. And then I put down inheritance, domicile, they had no rights to any of these things. Imagine not even inheritance, and several other rights. I don't know how much you know about Article 24, which is the article I wrote, but uh, I mean, shall I read it to you, or is it no time left? Um, well, I'd love to let a few people ask questions if we can. All right, can, what can I have, how many more minutes? A half. A half minute. <laughs> well, to make a long story short, I uh, came out of there, and the Constitution, the constitutional things that I wrote, that I wrote that had been cut out were cut out, period. It was then presented to the Japanese government, and the Japanese government was to look at it for one month, and then we would have another meeting. And to the next meeting, I'll take one minute. <laughs> In the next meeting with the Japanese officials, only the Japanese officials and the steering committee, and General Whitney, and I was only invited as an interpreter, not as a writer of the Constitution. The only person who was invited because he had written something for the Constitution was the one who had written on the Emperor. Otherwise, nobody was there. Met with this committee at 10 o'clock in the morning. I thought it would be all over because, after all, they had worked on this for a month. They knew what it was. And it turned out to become such a fight between the Japanese and the Americans that only the one part about the emperor, this, this law, took four hours. We had to translate another constitution which the Japanese had especially prepared for us, a new one. And to translate what they had prepared and then co compare it to what we had written, we thought we would both have basic thing that has been translated into Japanese, our constitution, you know, then you can just compare this way. We had to quadruple mm -hmm. our interpreting and translating. And we had five interpreters, and one of them, the head of it, I married later on. But he, <laughs> he, and so I, the Japanese love it when I tell them that a lot of things came out of the constitution, including my marriage to my husband. So anyway, uh, that uh, uh, happened so that we fought and fought and fought. And finally, the man sitting next to me, one of the Japanese officials, took a document out of his, out of his pocket, put it on the uh, table. He was very, very good in English. And then he went that way. And my husband, Joe, future husband, was sitting over here. And he saw this document. He turned around. And he saw a document. He just looked at it. And he saw something constitutionally opened it. It was an exact translation of what we had written. So he went to Colonel Cadiz and he said, now why don't we use this? Then we will be discussing from an equal point of view and it will be much easier and much faster. Everybody was very tired by this time. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. Tired. You know, constitutional language, not easy. So anyway, at two o'clock in the morning, the next morning, we worked all the way through. We got to the women's rights. And when the women's rights came out, the first outburst was tremendous. This is against our culture. This is against our history. This is against everything we stand for. We can't have this, the Japanese said. And Colonel Cadiz, 
very smart, and he saw that the Japanese were very in favor of me because I was a very fast translator and interpreter. And it was 2 a.m. Everybody wanted to go to bed. And so he said, Hades, gentlemen, he didn't say that I had written it. He just said, Miss Sirona has her heart set on the women's rights. Why don't we pass them? And they passed them. <laughs> <laughs> they passed them. And my explanation is, that they were, first of all, terribly tired. <laughs> Secondly, they did know that it would, they would have to pass some of it. After all, we were the occupation forces. And MacArthur had said we should have some women's rights, but they could have cut out a few things. And they did, which I didn't know about because it was so, I, I had thought my own people had cut this out. And I only found out a year ago from a Japanese scholar who had taken the constitution that was sent to the Japanese, you know, when they were supposed to react to it, after MacArthur had seen it, and in there he said he saw, and it wasn't that important, it was just I wanted for emphasis, where I said marriage shall be on an equal basis, and then in parentheses, not because of the parents' pressure, or a man's pressure. And I thought Colonel Cady's probably read that and thought it was repeating. You know, it was repeating the same thing. It has to be on an equal basis. But it wasn't so. It was in. And then in the Japanese government, they did change a few things, and those were the two other little things they changed. And I always blamed Cady's for that. I wish he was still alive. I could tell him. But it's not he. I never mentioned it to him because I was embarrassed, you know, <laughs> later. But anyway, so anyway, that's, I mean, this is a true story that you have heard from me personally, from the artifact, don't forget. <laughs> Want to have a question and answer period, if you like. If you have to leave, feel free to, but please, yeah. Um, in your memoir, you talked about. Um, Could you come closer? It would be easier. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you don't have a microphone <coughs> for the students, do you? No. So totally please, don't. will the people who who are going to ask questions come closer? So yes. Or talk about it. Or talk about it. And be be very Japanese, very polite. <laughs> yes. Uh, in your memoir, you talked about um, how you thought that it was really important to include women's rights in the Constitution because you had personally interacted with a lot of Japanese people. And you talked about how you felt that it was really important to include women's rights in the Constitution because you had personally interacted with a lot of Japanese people. And I understand you're still in contact with a lot of Japanese women who work with a lot of the society and everything. Yes. Well, I get this question quite often. I think compared to what it was, it is tremendous what the Japanese women have accomplished during these 60 years, which is nothing in history. And secondly, the Japanese women have been very, very active even now, in this terrible period with Mr. Abe, where they really are afraid. And by the way, that is one of the reasons that I did not speak about this, although about my being part of the Constitution, because at first it was top secret, and that was not lifted, that classification, to 1972. But I didn't want to speak about it for other reasons. There were, of course, people who knew. I mean, you can't keep a thing like that as a secret that Americans were involved, but it was not generally known in the general public. But I had heard from somebody that they had re read a derogatory article in one of the newspapers around 72 or 73 after the occupation forces left, 
in which it said, how can an article written by a 22-year-old be correct? And I didn't want that to be used, you know, using me to denigrate the Constitution. So I decided not to talk at all. I didn't give any interviews, except to some Americans, and very few. And also, I started a completely different life with, you know, cultural affairs, interchange uh, between music and dance and theater from Asia to America. So I didn't. But when Colonel Cady's, you know, in 95 or 4, came out with it, after all, he was a, a you know, very important person in the occupation, he went on television and was interviewed about the Constitution, and he was asked about women's rights, and he told the people who, who were making the film that they should go to Miss... Mrs. Gordon, I was now Mrs. Gordon, that he should ask me because I had written that part and I knew more about it than he did. That's when I started to first come out with it. And it was true, I go all over Japan now speaking in many, many different places. I think I have been to maybe, I don't know, 150 colleges and uh, volunteer women's groups and spoken about what I did, they, none of them knew. And they all said, we thought this was a natural development. <laughs> we thought that we had these rights just... And it shows how badly they have been educated in the last years. In the beginning, they were very well educated till I think the occupation left because they had little books on the Constitution for schools and for colleges. I have one old one. Very good. Then, after a period of time, they stopped doing that, and of course, with Koizumi and all that, and forget it, you know? So, uh, I uh, have been speaking, you know, a lot. And of course, I'm only one voice, and I'm sure, uh, you know, the American government wouldn't be very happy about this either, because um, they don't, I don't, they don't really want uh, the peace clause. You know, I mean, they really want Japan to help America. But to me, the peace clause, I had nothing to do with it. I, I don't know who wrote it. We, no, nobody knows. They think that MacArthur wrote it. Colonel Cady said, oh, no, he thinks Mr. Hussey wrote it. Whoever did it. But, you know, I was, became very peace conscious the way, of course, the Japanese did, because if you have seen Hiroshima, you know, then you know that <laughs> you want peace. And so the women, because of the peace clause also, are terribly interested in the Constitution. And of course, the people that I know, I would say at least 60% of these women are against Abe, I'm sure. And uh, I meet, you know, very fascinating women like the Takako Doi, who was the first speaker of the House in Japan. I'm so proud in a way because <laughs> Our Speaker of the House is the first one here, Pelosi, mm -hmm. after the Japanese from our constitution. <laughs> so, uh, you see, it, it has all kinds of uh, ramifications, but I know the Japanese women are not completely happy. You cannot be, you can't jump from the kind of militarism that I described to you with the Kempe Tai. Do you think it was only me and my mother and father that they followed and, and knew everything about? You know, I'm sure there were many Japanese, like Kato Shizue and so on, who were the feminist leaders, and other people. It was a military, a totalitarian state, no question. And so to jump from that in 60 years, when the parents, are, a lot of them are still alive, you know, and then there were people born right then, at, like in Hiroshima. They know a lot, too, because at first it was discussed, and they could see. But the other next generation really doesn't know at all about the horrors. You should see Hiroshima now. Beautiful, beautiful. But when I was there, you know, you were afraid to go close because somebody, a time correspondent, had brought us, when I was still in New York, a photograph he took of a of a purse that was lying there in the stones, in the rubble. And he brought the photograph to time, and you could see everything inside. It was an x-ray-like thing. 
That's how potent it was. And I had seen that, and I remember in the office that all the women ran away from the photographer, saying they didn't want any radioactivity from him, you know. I don't know if it works that way. Anyway, we ran out of the room. <laughs> but after that kind of horror, and then I saw the Hiroshima maidens, this, you probably heard of the 17 who came to America to be, you know, made, made normal for marriage because their faces were all scarred from the atomic bomb. And I saw them, and I spoke to them, and I was going to get involved with them and all that. I didn't, because Norman Cousins, who had invited them, didn't like that. I, I, I said their approach should be, they already had, had had a few operations, so they didn't look, you know, like monsters or anything like that, but you could see what they had. And I said, you know, if one would tell the, these young women to go to various universities and colleges and talk about themselves, and if you see them, it would really be a step towards peace. And he disagreed and he said it would be exploiting them. Not at all. The Japanese women did not feel that way. But he didn't do it and I thought then I can't work with him, you know, so I didn't. And um, anyway, so I just want to say the women are very much interested in the peace clause also, very much. But I, don't, I can't blame them for not doing more than they did. I think they did a tremendous amount. And I've been all over, you know, not just in the cities. I've gone to the country. And I know there are still women who are forced into all kinds of things, like, you know, the eldest son's wife has to take care of the parents. Remember, things like that still go on. I'm very much surprised sometimes. I don't even know. Go to their houses and we talk, and then I suddenly hear a noise, and I said, oh, there's a noise in that room. What, what, what is there? My parents-in-law says the lady of the house, who is a true feminist and goes to all lectures and everything and, and works, but what could she do? It's very difficult. So last time I said, she came to my lecture, I said, let's have a cup of coffee. She says, no, I have to go home to take care of my mother-in-law. The father-in-law had died in between, to take care of my mother-in-law. I said, why can't your husband do it? Why can't your sister-in-law do it? Do they live very far away? She said, no. So why don't they do it? She said, because they can't stand their parents, and they can't stand the mother, and there has to be somebody, and I have to be it. So that still exists, I know that very well. But it's not the fault of the modern Japanese woman, I don't think, at all. It, they, could, they did what they could. They are all over in all the legislatures in Japan. There's a woman governor, a, a vice governor. There are people, there was a woman who was on the Supreme Court in Japan, a woman. I mean, it's incredible. And every woman I meet who, you know, talks about her progress. By the way, a movie is coming out about that. If it comes ever to Japan, you should see it. <laughs> it's, it's very embarrassing. It's called Beate's Gift. But what is, <laughs> but you know, I never could change any of the titles that the Japanese thought were good. And so I didn't, you know, what could I say? Anyway, in that they show the original women, and of course they are very old now, who became very prominent, like the president of a company, you know, Kodansha, for example. The president is a woman. And there are others in other things, you know, whatever. And uh, that movie actually has already played all over Japan. And it has now been uh, uh, subtitled in English, and there will be one subtitled in French, one in Russian, and one in German. So once that gets going, uh, that will be very interesting. And the, we're waiting for you know, it. yeah, they are now, and they're making a what is that other thing DVD. called? C D DVD. DVD. Yes, making a DVD of it. Yes. No, no, no. Please. If you still have a question, maybe you'll stand around up here for a minute, and people can come up. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.